The following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, have you forgiven yourself? Well, you, you need to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about that this evening. Good evening. I'm Keith Sharp. You're watching Search the Scriptures. My partner is Trevor Campbell. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the Brethren in Payette. Yeah, thanks, Keith. My name is Trevor. I do preach in Payette and worship there with a the group that meets on Highway 62 in Payette. We meet on the north side of the highway there, right next to Dollar General, so we're pretty easy to find. And we meet on Sunday mornings at 10.45 a.m. for a worship service. At 10 a.m. we do have a Bible class, and you can come and ask questions and just have a Bible discussion with us, and we'd, we'd love to have your presence there. And if you'd like to reach me, my number is 870-435-2737. That's the number you can call me at if you have questions for the program here that you're watching, or if you have a question about the church that meets in Payette, give me a call there. Thank you, Trevor. You folks over in Marion County, be in touch with Trevor and go and buy and worship with the congregation there in Piatt. Of course, I'm Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. We meet one mile south of the Highway 62-412 bypass on the way to Salesville. If you'll turn off of the bypass onto Highway 5 South, you'll pass the Good Samaritan on the right, then look on the left and you'll see the sign for the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. We invite you to our services all the time. We have our Sunday morning worship assembly at 10 o'clock, or excuse me, that's the Bible classes at 10 o'clock. The worship assembly at 11. We have another worship assembly at 2 in the afternoon. We have our Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m., and we have a ladies' Bible class that you ladies are invited to it's at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. It's a very good study. I invite you, you ladies to be a part of that at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Now, if you have questions for me, Keith Sharp, you can call me at 870-321-5746. Or if you prefer, you can email me at keithsharp2021 at gmail.com. Or you can write to Post Office Box 263 in Mountain Home. 72654. Let us know what your question is. Your questions generate the subject matter on this program. We do have a question before us this evening, and that question is, can I be forgiven if I don't forgive myself? Trevor, tell us about that. You know, it's an excellent question. I think it's something that I think everybody struggles with this. Anybody with a, a good conscience, at least, and a good heart is going to struggle with this, that when we sin, the, the impact of our sin kind of lingers. Um, sometimes it, it stays on our minds and on the minds of others even that may have witnessed it or been affected by it. And so it can be difficult to, to let go of those things and not allow them to continue to, to kind of hinder us. Um, so the fact is, if we're doing the will of God, the Bible teaches, God forgives us of our sins. And when our sins are forgiven by Him, well, then they're forgiven. Now, the sin may still be in my mind, in my heart. I may still remember those sins. They may still bother me at times. But the fact is, God has forgiven me. So the, the idea of forgiving self, I think, really has to do more with our, our guilt and our own recollection of our sins. You know, in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 1, and I'm just going to begin in verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that means we're walking with Christ and acting as Christ would. We have fellowship with one another. That's all those saints, all the people that walk in the same manner. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The fact is, everybody commits sin. Everybody makes mistakes. And so this is just a fact. So we have to confess those to God. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now there's nothing there that says that, that if my sin is still on my mind that God hasn't forgiven it. He forgives it. It's really my problem now. <laughs> I'm the one who needs to let go of it. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the fact is we're going to commit sins and, and it's difficult at times because many, well, many times 
uh, you know, sins uh, are, are just within ourselves. Maybe a sin of the mind, you have an evil thought, or you're angry with someone, you, you wish evil upon them or something, and, and then you regret it and you, later and you ask forgiveness. But then there sometimes there are sins that are more public in nature. People witness an outburst of wrath, or maybe we, we committed adultery, or something of that nature that was more public in nature. And people are aware of it, and they've seen it, and they know about it. Or unfortunately, you may have even made the, the local news, you know, over a sin that you committed. And so those things can be really difficult to let go of. However, I believe the Bible teaches that we need to move forward. And really, if we, you know, concern ourselves and busy ourselves with acts of righteousness and works of righteousness, then it will, it will lessen the effect of those past sins. That, that kind of goes away when we're focused on good things. I think the Apostle Paul is an excellent example of that, a man who really moved forward in righteousness. But before we, uh, we get into anything like that, actually, I'm going to turn it back to Keith in just a moment. I, I want to come to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 for just a moment. Now, in the first letter to Corinth, the Apostle Paul had written to them concerning a man that was part of their congregation who was committing fornication. And so Paul instructed them what to do. He said, you can't just go on like everything's fine. That man needs to, to be put out of the congregation with a purpose, not with hatred, but out of love, because you want him to feel the sin and feel the burn of sin. They, God wants that individual to realize he's no longer accepted by God's people, by the assembly. And so by doing so, the individual repented. And he came back, he repented of that sin and came back to the congregation. And so chapter 2 uh, seems to be uh, Paul kind of uh, summing up what they're to do now since the man has come back and has repented. I think this is important. It says in verse 6, this punishment, which was inflicted by, <coughs> excuse me, by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. A lot of times, this is the issue. We, we, our, our sins haunt us to such the degree that, that we're sorrowful over them, or we mope about, or we don't feel like we're any good. That's not good. We, we really need to move forward. And he's, he's uh, encouraging the, the Corinthians to move forward. Forgive this man, now comfort him, and, and be there for him, and, and let's get moving. Verse 8, Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you're obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. So they had put the man out of the congregation so that he would be ashamed of his sin. And he was, and he repented, and he came back. Well now what do they need to do? Reaffirm your love, forgive him. You've got to move forward, not continue to make him sorrowful or continue to alienate him or make him feel guilty over his sin. That's wrong. That, that, that's a terrible mistake. That's a, that's a sin within itself. If someone repents of their sins and they, they ask forgiveness, we see they've changed their lives, and we continue to bring up those past things, or we, we ignore them or treat them poorly or coldly because of past events, that's just, now we're the ones who are sinning. Now we're, we're the ones who are wrong. In verse 12, or in verse 11, this is really important. He says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. All right. When we hold people's sins against them that they've repented of and asked forgiveness of, and they're move, we can see them moving forward. Well, we're, we're allowing Satan to take advantage of us, and now we're, we're guilty of sin. But the reason I come to this text, you know, the person that asks, can I be forgiven even if I don't forgive myself? The fact is, if you allow that sin to continue to hinder you and you continue to be sorrowful over it, and you're not moving forth in righteousness, well, you've allowed Satan to take advantage of you. So Satan can, uh, this is one of the ways that he, he, one of the tools that he uses is it, going to be our own guilt and our own past history, if you will, against us. The fact is, when we sin, it's a part of our history. We remember it, the people around us remember it, you can't erase people's minds, it's just part of history. But our good works are also a part of history in the same way. So let's move forward in, in good works. All right, Keith, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks for the good comments, Trevor. Uh, and, and I think you've well defined what forgiveness is and whom we are to forgive. I want to make just one comment. Uh, it's absolutely true that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I believe that's 1 John chapter, well, actually it's Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, but also in, in 1 John 1, verse 9, uh, all have sinned. And so that's an absolute truth. Everyone who's responsible before God has sinned. It doesn't mean that we will inevitably sin in the future. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39. The apostle, the apostle Paul says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. So we don't have to sin. We can avoid sin. We need to learn the difference between right and wrong, make up our minds to do what is right, and seek the help of God in doing what's right as we pray to Him. And, and we don't have to sin, but all of us have sinned. None of us will go to heaven on the basis of sinless perfection. Now, back to this matter of forgiving myself. I believe that Trevor has said the truth on it. Uh, we, we, forgiveness is to send away what somebody else has done against you and, is, and to treat it as if it never happened. Well, how can I sin against myself? The only thing that I, I could say I will forgive myself of if I've sinned against myself. Well, the only sin against the body is fornication. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, uh, the Apostle Paul says, all sin is uh, outside the body, but he who commits fornication sins against his own body. So that's the only sin that we can sin against ourselves, against our own body, is fornication. Now, if you have committed fornication, you need to receive forgiveness from God, and you need to let it go as far as what, because you've wronged your own body by being joined to a harlot, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But that's the only sin we can sin against ourselves, our own body. Well, what we have to have is the faith to accept that God does forgive us. In 1 John, and, and uh, Trevor's already referred to this, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he's, the apostle John says, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will forgive our sins. That's the promise. Now, do I believe him or not? If I confess, and of course, that's a figure of speech, the part for the whole, that includes repentance, confession, uh, and also uh, confessing, our sin, well, confessing our sins to God, repentance, and determining never to do that again. And if we do that, if we repent of our sins, confess our sins, and ask God to forgive us, then God forgives us. That's His promise. We have to believe His promise. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the apostle, well, the writer of the Hebrew letter says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We have to have the faith to believe that God will do what he says he will do. And that is, if I repent, if I confess, if I ask him to forgive me, then, and that's of course as a Christian, then he will forgive me. And I need to accept that, that I'm forgiven, that he's not holding against me. Now that doesn't mean that have that guilt of sin does not humble me and cause me to realize that I'm not deserving of the blessings that I have from God. In fact, I should have that attitude. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look there please, the Apostle Paul is writing in verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. And so, Paul never forgot the fact that he had been the chief persecutor of the, of the disciples of Christ. And that weighed on his mind. He knew he was forgiven. He accepted the forgiveness from God, but nevertheless it humbled him to realize, I'm not worthy to be an apostle. And I, should, I could say, I'm not worthy to be called a child of God. But because I believed, repented, confessed, and was baptized into Christ, he forgave me of all my sins. And when I sin, I can say, I'm not worthy of his forgiveness. And that's true. But because God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, I must by faith accept the fact that he has forgiven me. Now, Paul did that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 
This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Notice in verse 16, however, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul's forgiveness as the chief of sinners, as the most uh, uh, vile persecutor of God's people, Paul's forgiveness is a pattern for all time to come that God will forgive us if we're, even if we're the chief of sinners. He never forgot it. It humbled him. But he nevertheless accepted the fact that God had forgiven him, and he rejoiced in that forgiveness. And so we don't forgive ourselves. We accept the forgiveness that God has given us, and we rejoice in that realizing we don't deserve his forgiveness, but he's gracious to forgive us if we meet the terms of pardon. Well, Trevor, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. You know, I, I like what you had to say about the Apostle Paul. Those were excellent points. You know, looking at the Apostle Paul, you go back through the text in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7, uh, he attended to the death of Stephen. Stephen was killed unjustly there. And the people that killed him laid their feet, uh, laid their, excuse me, their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That was Paul. He was uh, previously known as Saul. That was his Hebrew name. Later as Paul, his Greek name. But in chapter 8 and in verse 3 of Acts, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. All right, so that's what he's doing in Jerusalem. Now, I think it's of, of note that you know, he's throwing men and women into prison. And so these are people's brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, and so forth. Um, after he repents, there's no doubt that he's going to come across these people that he threw their very family members into prison, threw their friends and brethren into, into prison. Uh, but the way the scriptures read, it did not hinder him from just pushing forward and, and doing what's right and speaking truth. In fact, you know, later on, it's in chapter 9 of the book of Acts where the Lord appears to him. And after the Lord appeared to him, he was so shaken up um, that he did not eat or drink for three days. He fasted for that time. He was very remorseful over his sins. And in verse 19 of Acts 9, it says, So when he had received food, that's Paul, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And I love this because, well, how long do I have to wait after we've you know, been caught in a sin before we get back on our feet and get moving? The Bible says here, immediately, Right? And, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, Paul may have gotten some odd looks from people and, and so forth. In fact, I think it's in the text here that people didn't trust him uh, later on in the text. Um, in fact, uh, later on, he's going to need the help of, of Barnabas because even the, the disciples at Jerusalem didn't trust Paul, that he had really changed, that he had really repented. And Barnabas has to come and give testimony that, no, this guy's all right. All right, he's, he's on the right track. So, you know, people, people knew Paul's sin, but immediately, what's he do? He picks himself up, he begins, he just does a flip, a 180. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Verse 21, then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who, he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? So now he's in Damascus preaching Jesus Christ. People are amazed. They know who he is. He has a reputation of being this incredibly, to them, wicked man, casting Christians into prison and so forth. But he doesn't let that stop him. He moves forward. He's going to visit Jerusalem time and again. He's going to run into people that, again, he threw their family members into prison, unlikely. Well, you just got to move forward. There, there was things that, and there are things in our lives that we can't undo. They're just part of our history now. But we've got to move forward. In the book of Luke, and in Luke chapter 3, when John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, there were individuals that came to him, and he told them to repent, and he told them to bear fruits worthy of repentance. And so in verse 10, the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? That's a good question. What do you mean by this? And so he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, What shall we do? 
And so he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, but be content with your wages. Now, what's interesting is, you know, John's answer is just so simplistic. Just go out and do what's right. Just, just go out and be just. Do, do, you know, do, use just judgment and do the right thing. So their past sins, the Lord, of course, he was doing a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. So God is going to forgive their sins, but what do they do? Well, they just got to move forward. They just got to keep on going. And Keith, we've got a little time. If it's all right, I'd like to give another example. Sure. All right. In the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, I really like this, this particular example for a reason. Hebrews chapter 11, we have a woman here who's brought up amongst all these individuals who are spoken of because of their faith. Faith, their faith justified them before God. Their works of faith justified them before God. And so there are both men and women listed in Hebrews chapter 11. One of the women listed is a woman named Rahab. Now, what is interesting is her name just isn't brought up, but also her previous life and conduct is brought up. In verse 31, it says, By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, when she had received the spies with peace. Now, how would you like to have that as your title through history? You're the harlot Rahab. Her, her sin is connected with who, who she is there, if you will, but it's really not. You know, that, that was her previous conduct. She was a harlot, and that's how, when you go to the Old Testament, that's how it reads. She was a harlot in the city of Jericho. But she did not perish because she had faith in God. And so what the Holy Spirit focuses on, what God focuses on, is her faith, not her past conduct and her past sin, but rather her faithful conduct and how she hid the spies and sent them out with, uh, uh, she received them and sent, sent them out with peace. So, you know, how'd you like, to, again, to have that kind of title, you know, throughout history attached to you, Rahab the harlot or harlot, the harlot Rahab. Um, nonetheless, you know, she moved forward and she joined God's people, the Israelite nation. And of course, she is a descendant of Jesus Christ uh, himself in the lineage there. Take a look at James, because James also brings her up. And it's, it's interesting that he brings her up in the, in the same fashion uh, that she's brought up there in, uh, in uh, the book of Hebrews there. In chapter 2 of James, and in verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot, again, there's, it's like a title, Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So in the text, James was talking about doing acts of, or acts of faith, yeah, uh, works uh, to show your faith. So in verse 25 there, again, Rahab the harlot, she was justified by works. God focuses completely on her faith and on the works that she did and not on the fact that she was previously a harlot, but that's the title she carries. So again, you know, our sins, they're part of our history. Uh, people around us, like with Paul's situation, many people knew who he was and how he behaved. We can't erase those things, but we have to find a way to move forward and not let those things hinder us. Otherwise, Satan does take advantage of us. If we're continually sorrowful over our past sins, we, when we're not able to do the, the good work God has for us to do in the kingdom. We're not going to be able to do as Paul did or as Rahab did and move forward in faith. And that's something that we have to do. Well, Keith, I'll kick it back over to you. Okay, thanks, Trevor. Uh, we have another question. We only have about five minutes left in the program, uh, and we'll introduce this question, and maybe we can discuss it more fully uh, in next week's program. The question is, uh, is it ever okay to deceive? So Trevor, tell us about that. Well, I wasn't prepared to, uh, to make any comments on that question until next week, so I have nothing to say at this point. I have some thoughts on it, but I don't have my passages that I'd like to... Uh, to go to ready. So if you have some things to yeah, say. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a few things and then I, we'll plan to discuss that in more detail in next week's program. But I'll right. just say a few things. The rule that Christians are to follow, that everybody should follow, is to speak the truth every man to his neighbor. who are members one of another. Uh, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25. Uh, and the, uh, the Ten Commandments are not applicable today from the Old Testament, but because nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, then they are applicable. In Romans chapter 13 is one place where the Apostle Paul shows that this does apply to us today. 
Uh, he says, I'm beginning in verse 8 of Romans chapter 13. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, well, of course, that's the, that's the summary of the part of the Ten Commandments that apply to our relationship to one another. It doesn't include those that apply to our relationship to God because he's talking about loving one another. And he goes ahead to say, if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And so the general rule that Christians must follow is to be, as sometimes we say, brutally honest. Just to tell it like it is. And, and not to back off of telling the truth, the absolute truth. We must be honest with one another. And by the way, that includes if a brother has sinned or if a sister has sinned, then what should I do? Go and tell him his fault. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Now that's a personal sin. But it's our responsibility because of love to one another that when a brother commits a sin, and I know of it, then I don't look the other way. I don't ignore it. But I go to that brother and talk to him and say, look, this is a sin. You need to repent of that sin. I can do it in a loving way. I don't have to be harsh about it. I can show my care for him. But nonetheless, he has to know that he's done something wrong. Otherwise, he won't know he needs to repent. And he can't be saved unless he repents. And so the general rule is to always speak the truth to one another. Now that does not mean that we have to say everything. Sometimes it is best to withhold some truths or some things that people are not yet ready to, see, to receive. In John chapter 16, verse 12, John, I'll turn over and read that rather than quoting it so we'll get it, get it for sure right. In John chapter 16, verse 12, However, when He, the Spirit of the truth, has come... Well, I've, I've got the wrong passage there, Trevor. Uh, it's where Jesus told His disciples, I have many things to say to you, but you're not yet ready to receive them. Uh, and so Jesus Himself said that there were some things He was hiding from His apostles. They were not ready to receive those things. But when they were ready, they would be revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. And so, there's sometimes things that people are not yet ready to receive. It would hurt them spiritually rather than help them. We don't deceive them. We don't lie to them. We just hold that back until they're ready to receive that. And I believe, by the way, that's the principle in leading people to Christ. That the first things they need to know is, is that there is a God. And that Jesus is a son. And the Bible is the word of God. If I start talking to them about their sins, and they don't have, haven't even accepted those things, then I'm simply going to drive them away. They're not yet ready to receive those things. And so we must say those things they're ready to receive. Trevor, we have just a few seconds left. Anything you want to add? Uh, no, that's good. You know, I like... Uh... I like what we did on the, on the first subject. Um, I'd like to discuss more, the, more of the second subject next week okay. because I do have some passages I'd like to focus on. So Sure, we'll we plan that. on that next week. Okay. So we simply thank the audience for listening this evening, for watching the program, and we hope that you will come again and watch the program. And until next week, we you, bid you a very pleasant good evening. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654, and your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then... The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.